For me, I think a lot of people think that therapy is only for people who are really depressed or crazy or something has to be going really bad in my life. And I think what therapy actually is, is a way to be a better communicator. It's a way to understand what your triggers are. So there's so many important tools. And I think when it can be looked at, when people see it more as like, oh, this is a way to be the most successful and best version of myself. When you can shift that thinking, it's such a powerful tool. Obviously, you can tell I'm passionate about it. Like, I feel like the world would be a better place if everyone was in therapy. This is Startup the Storefront. Today's guests are Kendall Bird and Sage Grazer, co-founders of Frame, a mental wellness network that is a one-stop shop for therapy. On the user end, you can search around and connect with therapists. And on the back end, it allows the therapists access to the tools they need to run their practice. This is therapy for the modern times. The stigma around therapy has been eroding for a while now, and I truly think it's for the better. We all need to feel heard. We all have problems. We are all fighting our own battles. And if you turn to a licensed professional to help you grow, all the more power to you. So listen in as we cover everything from how Kendall and Sage went from running a lemonade stand as kids to launching Frame earlier this year, why something as simple as movement is such an important part of mental health, and we learn of the existence of therapist influencers. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we have Frame. So this question, either one of you can take it. Give people a sense of what your company does. Yeah, so Frame is a mental wellness platform that makes it easier to connect with therapists in different ways, both digitally and in person. And we offer, on our platform, we like to think of it as a holistic approach to therapy for different stages of your personal growth discovery. And we offer two core services on our platform. So our first one is geared more towards people who haven't tried therapy yet. They're curious about it. They wanna improve their personal growth, but they're not really sure if they're ready for a therapy experience. And for them, we offer our digital discussions And these are live stream um, therapy discussions led by licensed therapists that you can tune into anonymously and watch from your own house. And it gives you just a sense that there's volunteer participants and it gives you a sense of what a therapy session is like. And we cover a bunch of different topics. And at the end, then after the session is done, we record it and we upload it to our site. So there's also content that you can watch on your own time. And then our second service is for people who are ready to match with their own therapist and ready for that one-on-one experience. And for them, we offer our therapy matching. You come on our site, you answer 10 questions, you get six therapy matches. We facilitate free intro calls. You schedule through our platform. You can meet them in person pending COVID or telehealth through our platform. And then you pay through our platform. So it's the whole one-stop shop for um, therapy. And what made you guys want to start the company? Was it something that you were experiencing yourselves? Was it very personal? And it was just hard to either maybe find the right therapist and you just thought this should be in a digital environment? And what was, what was the beginnings of this? I grew up, the the story starts with me. (laughs) Um, We grew up next door to each other in Los Angeles and we both were in therapy in high school. Um, I was started therapy when I was 15. It was such a big part of my life, and I kind of just never stopped. I went on and off in college, and then after college, I was living in New York, and it's just been such a big part of, like, me growing into an adult, a functioning adult, like, helped me in every aspect of my life, and when I moved, I actually moved back to Los Angeles for a job at Snapchat, and I, I was working at YouTube in New York, moved back to Snapchat, and I was really stressed. I was doing long distance. We hadn't IPO'd yet. And I was like, okay, I need to talk to someone. And I found, I, it literally was the worst experience trying to find a therapist. I guess I'd like throughout my life, I'd kind of lucked out and just always found one or my parents had found them for me. And it was the first experience. It took me eight months. I spent over a thousand dollars meeting with different therapists that I didn't like. And it led me to reconnect with Sage, who I knew was a therapist. And I'll let you go from there, Sage. Yeah. So like Kendall said, I, you know, I went to therapy when I was a teenager and it was really meaningful for me. And it, it was kind of the first time I felt like I understood myself and I understood why I did the things I did. And so that therapist was really instrumental in my personal growth. So it inspired me to want to become 
the therapist to someone else. So I'm actually a licensed clinical social worker and a practicing therapist here in Los Angeles. And Kendall, uh, when she came to me to talk about, you know, her trouble finding a therapist, I was telling her about how hard it is as a therapist to build your private practice because I went to school to be a therapist. I love my clinical work. I care about, you know, providing the best treatment for my clients, but doing all of the practice management and the marketing and figuring out how to make my own website and all of that was not in my wheelhouse. So it was really difficult. I tried a bunch of different platforms. I didn't feel like they were getting me good client leads. I was spending extra money. And when you're starting your practice, it's like every penny really counts. So Kendall um, proposed the idea of building our own platform to help these two sides connect. <laughs> What's interesting to me is I, I know like it's hard enough for some people to, to decide I need therapy or I need to go find a therapist. Like my sister, I'll just give you a story personally. So my sister's like, hey, I need to go find therapy. I'm like, oh, it's so amazing. You sh we should all be talking to someone, no matter what. All of us in some form need therapy. But I told her, I'm like, just so you know, going down that road, be prepared for it not to match right out of the gate, right? You have to put in work to find the right person. You need to feel comfortable with the person you find. And so I don't know if this is true, but you must see it the same way, right? Where it's almost like people make the decision but that's really just the beginning of the journey. And then a, a hard part of it is the connection. Is that, is that how you guys see that? It's exactly right. Like I, my friends make fun of me. Like I'm a therapy super fan. Like it's always been, I'm like, I like reality TV. I like going to therapy. Like those are my hobbies besides working. And I was like, if I am such a therapy fanatic and it took me this long to find a therapist, for people that have just made up that decision that like maybe I need to talk to someone, it must be so easy to give up because it's such an overwhelming experience. You don't know who you, there's so many different credentials and titles and it's overwhelming and I don't know who I'm supposed to see and it's awkward. And I think that was one of the drivers for me is that for people who, you know, it's overwhelming. But I think another thing that was really, really motivating for me on the consumer side was that. I feel like there's such a misconception about what happens in therapy. And I feel like there's so many people, like even in Los Angeles that, you know, go to acupuncture, like really care about going to the gym, like want to be healthier people. And they just don't know a lot about therapy. And when I was at Snapchat and I started explaining to my coworkers, like how much it had helped me at my job being able to communicate better with my boss, they were like, wait, that's what you can do in therapy? I had no idea. And so I think for me, like making it less overwhelming and then also just creating a way to educate people about what actually happens in therapy were really the drivers for me of why I wanted to start it. And Sage comes from a completely different place being a therapist. Can you help people give a window into some of the myths? Like some of the ones I know, it, it gives you a good system, right? So it gives you like a identify and then you want to feel like uh, accept your feelings. Then it's almost like create value together, right? And so can you guys give us a sense of what are some of the things people think therapy is, but in reality, it's just like the building blocks for greatness, but maybe people just don't know what that is. Like, what's the bridge? For me, I think a lot of people think that therapy is only for people who are really depressed or crazy or something has to be going really bad in my life. I was once at a dinner with my girlfriends and someone said, I don't know why you go to therapy. Like no one's died in your family. And I was like, what? Wow. Um, and it, I was like, we're living in like a very woke, progressive city and there's still people are still saying stuff like that. And I think what therapy actually is, is a way to be a better communicator. It's a way to understand what your triggers are, like what are environments that put you, make you more anxious so that you can avoid them or work through them. It's made me be better at, um, setting healthier boundaries. Like you don't even realize, say Joy's jokes, I'm like, oh, I have perfect relationships. And you don't realize that you might actually have a really unhealthy relationship with your family, with your friends. So there's so many important tools. And I think when it can be looked at, when people see it more as like, oh, this is a way to be the most successful and best version of myself versus like, this is, I'm in a crisis, which it still is also for that too. But I'm, you know, like I'm, something is wrong with me. I've now been labeled as a crazy person. When you can shift that thinking, it's such a powerful tool. And I, obviously you can tell I'm passionate about it. Like, I feel like the world would be a better place if everyone was in therapy. Something I've learned in therapy too, is that people will tell me, 
in fact, a lot of investors that I pitch will be like, well, I don't go to therapy, but I have a friend that I use as a therapist that's really great. And I'm like, mm hmm, okay. And what I learned in therapy is that without even knowing it, that we all project our own um, biases and insecurities on people. And I was someone who was, I never realized until I went to therapy that I was someone that I overly ask for multiple people's decisions when I'm trying to make my own decision or opinions. I'll say, what do you think? And what do you think? And it can be exhausting when you don't realize that they're, that's, you've actually hit a trigger of something they're wildly insecure about. And you mm -hmm. don't realize they're actually projecting on you and saying like, oh, well, you shouldn't move, you know, because you'll never make it in that new town. And maybe they like had, you know, had a similar experience. And when I learned that, I was like, oh, that's so interesting. And if, so I think it's like, even if you're trying to make a big decision in your life or smaller decisions, to go to someone who has no agenda, who's literally trained professionally to not have a biased opinion um, and, and just give you like, well, what, you know, well, what have you thought about it from this perspective? And to have that in a safe space is so important. Or sometimes I'll even be like, you know, I got in a fight with my husband, like, was I being an asshole? I don't know. Mm. And, you know, sometimes they're like, yeah, that was kind of mean. And at least I can trust her opinion as like an honest one. And so I think to me, that is something that I would love for more people to experience because I think it's invaluable. That was a long winded answer. I'm sorry. No, that's great. Sage, same thing. Obviously, you're on a different side of it. So I just love to get your perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a lot of different things, but like Kendall said, if going to therapy isn't just when you're in crisis. I think that's one of the common misconceptions is that you go to therapy when you've hit rock bottom or when you're you know, in a really dark place. But yes, that, that is a time that you can go to therapy, but you also are going to need to address that crisis in therapy. And then after you do that, you can probably actually then address what the underlying issues are and what your own personal growth is going to lead you to. Because it's very hard to really look at yourself and do that kind of deep work when you're in crisis. I think that that's part of, you know, people think, oh, they go when they're in crisis and they get better and then that's when they leave. And really, I think you go when you're in crisis, that's when you, you know, get past that crisis and then you can actually work on yourself when you're not in a place of high distress. Some people feel like, I don't want to talk about my past, you know, my childhood, I don't need to get into that. And the truth is that therapy looks different for everyone and your therapy might not look like talking about your past, but also there's a lot of value in looking at our past because it, our past informs our present, right? And so looking at our early experiences and how that impacts the way that we interact with the world around us and the way we interact with people in our lives and the way that our neurobiology develops, uh, it's immensely helpful when you're moving forward in life. Well, one other thing too, another misperception is that I think therapy sort of been like dramatized on in movies and shows. And I think a lot of people are really surprised that the different types of therapists, like we have therapists on our platform that are Latino and black and young and old. And I think a lot of people just think it's like an old man with bifocals that like takes mm -hmm. notes. It's like we sit down, like in Good Will Hunting or something. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like you're sitting on that couch and you can't see them you're like in Mad Men or something. And a lot of the people who watch our digital discussions give us feedback that's like, I had no idea that a therapist could bring that kind of energy. Or like, I didn't realize that a therapist with like tattoo sleeves could be mm -hmm. on. And like, you know, they're so different and, and they all have different approaches. And I think that's something that blows people's mind when they watch our free content. Yeah. I mean, I, so my wife and I, so my wife, we, during COVID, we're just like, we're just like life planning. Right. And so we're like, Hey, are we going to thinking about having kids? And so my wife in her head, she wants, I don't know what, she wants this like five acres in somewhere in like Mulholland Drive here in LA overlook, like perfect. Everything's perfect with this garage, this amount of garage stalls and like this many children, and this type of kitchen. And I'm like, all of that's achievable, but why is it that you feel like you need that pre children? Right. And so, and then she's like, maybe I should talk to a therapist about this. And I was like, a hundred percent. I was like, talk to anyone, but me, don't talk to me. Cause I'm, my problem is I'm just too logical. And so to me, it's like, when you have, I think there's this fear, what I'm touching on is I think there's this fear that people, when they're about to have kids have that their life ends <laughs> once when, right. It's like, Oh, all of my pursuits die. Like I can't be an entrepreneur anymore. And there's this like cliff that people feel like 
And that's not the case. I know a tremendous amount of entrepreneurs that once they've had their, their children have found even greater successes, greater heights. And so I think there's a part of children that either galvanizes what you really believe in, that people are just afraid of, of finding out. And so I'll just say, I just wanted to share that personal story with you guys. Um, because I think it's, it's a window right into, it's not crisis. It can be just a big life decision and you should talk to someone. Totally. And I feel like, um, another thing you can do in therapy is understand for couples, how you guys process decisions differently too. And which I think is really interesting as well. And that, you know, the way that you guys were raised differently, like it pops up, like I've been married for just a year and we're going through similar things. We're like, I guess we have to plan our life now that we have all this free time on our hands. Yeah. Um, and like I, it, things I thought I knew and we were dating for five years. I, I mean, and things bubble up like as life happens and you're like, oh, that's interesting. And now that we've done couples therapy and I understand the way he was raised was very different than me that I'm like, huh. And like, it's just like a really interesting <laughs> dynamic. <laughs> like we process things very differently sometimes. And that's something you can understand in therapy of like just getting on the same page. <laughs> yeah. It's a journey for sure. What made you guys want to call the company Frame? So it, it was something that we struggled with the name a little because we didn't want it to be, you know, too like therapy space or something, you know, we wanted it to be something that resonated and that was also gender neutral. And I think for us frame hit because it's something that is a term that therapists use. And it's something for me as a patient, as a client, you know, it's all about framing your perspective in life mm. and thinking like, for example, thinking that, for example, I was never great at math growing up and i was always told my brother is the smart math one and i'm the social one and mm. like reinforcing that narrative and then going through therapy and reframing that whole narrative in my head of like oh no actually i'm really good at these things and stuff like that and for me that just hit and for sage i think it's like a little different I don't know. yeah i mean it's definitely a similar like what kendall just said it's that framing and reframing our perspectives and how we interact with the world and the people in our lives is part of what you do in therapy and reframing your thoughts because that is what can give you the power to kind of change how you're feeling and then also as Kendall said it's a term that we use in therapy so you can frame and reframe thoughts but also there is a frame to the therapy session and that's something that the therapist holds the frame which is kind of the time boundaries and the safe space and that's part of the therapist role. And from my understanding this is a relatively new venture for both of you. I mean, you, from my research, you had to accelerate the opening of the platform because of COVID. So can you talk us through what that was like in making that decision? And when were you originally planning on opening up to the public? So we were originally planning to open up in, I think, mid-May or June. Um, it was a pretty robust platform because we offer so many, it's kind of, it's a business in the box for therapists which we can get into in a little, but when COVID hit, it was like everyone was looking for resources and suffering at home and feeling so stressed. And so we decided to expedite the launch of our digital discussions. As I mentioned, there's two different services and we really, the vision was that they're together as an ecosystem and they feed into each other. And we decided to launch with just one um, so that people had this free resource at home and we covered a bunch of topics that are relevant to COVID um, and then uh, launched the matching like a month later. What's been the the user growth to date? I um, mean, it's been really great. It's, I mean, it's very early on, so I'm not giving any numbers, but I think we're really excited about what we've been seeing both on the discussion side of just like a general interest in wanting to know what therapy is like, which I think has been sort of influenced and shaped by what's going on in the world right now. And then um, what's been exciting too is um, a steady growth and the therapist signing up and also people, what's been fun to see is that our users are doing intro calls with at least two to three therapists, which is fun. Like I, did, I wasn't anticipating them to sort of use this as like a shopping experience, but I think it's the right way to do it because as I mentioned, like it's so much about who you feel comfortable talking to and an algorithm can only take you so far. And so it's been cool to hear from our users to say like, you know, I ta we talk to them and they say, I loved all three, but there was just one where I had this like insane connection with, and I felt so comfortable with her. 
So that's been really fun to see too. The question I have for, for both of you. So you have a two-sided market, right? Kendall, I'll direct the first half of the question at you and then the second half at Sage. How much uh, at, like of your experience, whether it was at YouTube or at Snap, has informed how you view this app, how you view the double-sided market? And then from Sage's perspective, what is it about therapists that are more than happy to jump in? Or, you know, what's the value prop? Obviously, I think with COVID, it's kind of like it's digital, right? And we can talk about that. But Kendall, from your side of it, having been at Snap, what has that been like in, in terms of creating this app? And how do you view this from a technology perspective? Yeah, I mean, I feel like being at Snap was, you know, I feel like Google and I was at Google and YouTube and there's such bigger companies where when you're in product marketing, you're a little bit more removed from the product because like there's like thousands of employees and being at Snapchat for almost four years, I was really just working with engineers every day and product people, which was great. And I feel like something that influenced me was how much emphasis Snap put on, um, user growth within organic user growth and how to derive that from your product versus using marketing and how can you get people to share within the product and it was something that I really thought about when we built this because marketplaces inherently you know struggle sometimes when they're trying to get new user acquisition and they have to rely so heavily on paid media and press and at a certain point that dries up or it becomes really expensive and it can really hinder the growth of the marketplace. So I thought, okay, in an industry where it is so inherently private and people don't want to be like tweeting and sharing about their personal therapy sessions, how can we create this product that can grow on its own and create these organic dialogues? And for us, that was one of the reasons why we did the digital discussions as a free tool um, so that people can experience what therapy is like, learn about it, and then also share about it and, sh and send a video to a friend like, hey, I, I know you just got dumped. Here's this, this therapist talking about it. And so that was something that I learned from Snapchat and brought along with me. How do you attract therapists to join the platform? What types of incentives does the platform provide? And how do you guys think about that as you guys try to, you know, really take this thing off? Yeah, so in terms of meeting a need that therapists have, you know, Kendall and I have built this platform very thoughtfully. And that's where my role as a therapist and my experience in the field has really come into play where I'm able to speak to, you know, what the needs of a therapist are in terms of how they run their business, what their calendar scheduling type needs are, what their billing needs are, what the HIPAA compliant component is. And so we've been able to build this, you know, again, kind of Kendall called it, calls it a business in a box. It's a one-stop shop for therapists for building their practice because they can do some basic practice management tools as well as getting new clients. So it's, you know, they have the marketing and the back end office, which is something that's unique and not anything that was out there. In terms of getting therapists, I've been reaching out to a lot of other therapists. And then the thing, it, like Kendall said, there's just a lot of natural sharing and therapists, when they find something that's helpful for them, they are eager to share it with their colleagues. And then I know you guys just raised some money. Kudos to you guys. How does it fit into your growth plans? And so we, just, we talked a little bit about your strategy in terms of organic growth and being cognizant of you don't want to be spending too much money maybe on, on digital media, given people probably aren't going to tweet that seeing a therapist. And so as you think about the levers that you have, obviously, we're, we're talking about this on the podcast. Um, but how do you guys think about getting out and, and really sort of leaving a dent in the marketplace for what you guys are doing? I think for us, we took a really unique approach. And I think for anyone out there who's thinking about starting a startup, like we're definitely not the first to market. And I feel like that can feel scary sometimes, but also can be a benefit because we spent a lot of time understanding, talking to customers and figuring out what some of our counterparts, you know, aren't doing. Um, and I think for us, um, for fundraising, we went out, we were actually a pre-seed company and we went out and raised money with the vision of our unique approach with them, you know, with investors being able to see what was already out there and seeing how we were different and we wanted to approach it differently. And right now as a pre-seed company, um, it's all about proof of concept, product market fit. Um, and then we're going to raise, you know, we're going out to raise our seed probably at the end of this year, at which point, you know, that money would be used to really help us scale um, the vision and get us out into multiple cities. So right now our matching is only available in Los Angeles. 
And how, in terms of COVID-19, have you feel like you've attacked it at the right time, just kind of on accident? What has been the early feedback you guys are getting? The early feedback is very strong and we're very excited um, for our next fundraising round. I think for us, mental health has always been important to us, Sage and I. So every day is mental health awareness day in our mind. Um, I think it, what wasn't an accident was we spent a lot of time understand, building in tools to make a telehealth platform. The original vision was that people would do a hybrid approach where we, I, I think like the modern consumer would be great if you could go see your therapist in person sometimes and then do a couple of video sessions. I'm traveling this week. I don't have time to drive in. Mm -hmm. And I think COVID allowed us to easily pivot to just a telehealth platform, which I think has been amazing. And then on top of that, like from a cultural standpoint, mental health has become so relevant right now. So I think we're looking at this time as an excited way to sort of like accelerate the growth and momentum that the culture has, like our society is placing on mental health right now. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, now if anyone needs it, now is the time and the stigmas are sort of being erased, I think anyway, or the appearance of that is happening. I was, I was also like, when I was younger, I started like a alcohol delivery app that did not work out, but it was like right place, right time. And I remember working with the local vendors and I just like, I feel like as a young kid, I was always like young kid, young entrepreneur, like having physical space is a very tough business for many reasons. And if you can create a solution that sort of extends beyond that, it's generally a smart, you know, a smarter way and more scalable way. So I kind of always thought, how can we solve this, you know, without being tied to one particular city and solving that? And how can we create telehealth solutions so that people in Fresno or Burbank or somewhere, you know, the smaller places can still get access to good therapists, even though they're all sitting in like Beverly Hills or whatever, Santa Monica. So I feel like we just, 2020 sort of pressure tested our ideas in the right way and they worked out. <laughs> you know, it seems to me that what you said earlier about how you had to pivot to being just a teletherapy app, you know, to me that opens up a lot of other doors. So my brother, for example, he has a therapist and it used to be this whole ordeal where he would, you know, have to go to, into downtown LA and see him and then travel back. And it adds all of this time, whereas now he's able to just do this over a phone call or, or Skype or Zoom. And, you know, he's just able to dedicate that hour, uh, three days a week to, to therapy and then go on. He doesn't have to add in the, the commute or anything like that. And it seems to me like a no brainer because from the outsider's perspective, there's always something to be said for having that in room person to person connection. But I feel like most of what can be gained from therapy can also be gained by having it over a teleconference or a video call or whatever. I mean, is, is there any truth to this or am I just like, you know, completely wrong here? I mean, I'll just chime in with my opinion. I think that a lot can be done in teleconference, right? Or telehealth and that, that it's been a huge resource and we've been so lucky as a therapist community to have this, to be able to have continuity of care. I mean, imagine if I was seeing all my clients or, all, you know, my colleagues are seeing their clients and then COVID hits and then they're just at home by themselves, no therapist, you know, no resources. Uh, that would be horrifying, uh, you know, as a clinician to have that happen. So I think overall telehealth, and then like you said, being able to cut out all of the transport time, being able to see a therapist that maybe is in a different price point, or that if you're in a certain location, a remote you know, part of California, that you can still see a therapist who's in a more urban area without having to go in. There is something to be said for having the in-person sessions and not having the barrier of you know, the computer and the little bit of delay and the tech issues. And then being able to have, you know, as a therapist, being able to create the safe space, because like I can make my office or my, you know, telehealth location as safe and quiet and comfortable and private as possible, but I have no control over what's going on in your environment. So as a therapist, you know, if I'm seeing, for example, a person who's in a relationship and they live with their partner, their partner is going outside and taking a walk while they're in a session, or they, you know, I have clients who will sit in the car, just in their parked car to have a session during this time because they need some privacy. So I think there's some barriers like that that, you know, are are still issues and that it will be great when people can go in person, but 
the advantage of having telehealth has been immense. And I think as a community, we're all very, very grateful. I think Sage and I are built for telehealth or frame, but we both have a soft spot in our heart for the in-person because so much of communication is nonverbal. It's in your body language. Like I always like go to my therapy session and I like sit like that and she's like, what's going on today? Like, I don't even have to say anything and, or the tone of voice. And uh, like she said, so, I mean, I think we would both love for it to get to a place where people can go back in person, but obviously it opens, telehealth opens us up to a lot of things that other professions can do. So, and as a therapist or a client, you want to be, you, you need to be able to feel safe when you're in a session. And if you're worried about your health and being at risk, you know, as a therapist or the client, you're not going to be able to be fully present and you're not going to be able to have a conductive session where you're, you know, making progress because you're going to be highly anxious or, you know, not able to engage. So I think right now telehealth is the best solution. You know, we've talked a couple of times during this podcast already about erasing the stigma of therapy and increasing the awareness of the importance of mental health. Is there any advice that you can give for how, you know, your average person might be able to maybe like, you know, 30 minutes a day or whatever it might take, like steps that you can take to try and just make it better your own mental health? Yeah, for me, I would say, I mean, there's so many different ways to improve your mental health that extend beyond therapy. You know, as Sage always says, movement is such an important part. Like if you're feeling stressed, like just don't underestimate the power of going out and taking a walk. Um, When it comes to therapy, though, I think so many people assume going back to these like misperception, misconceptions of therapy is that, oh, it's just, this isn't a big enough problem that I should talk about. Like, I'll just power through it. And I I think a lot of people hold a lot in that they don't necessarily have to. And it could be something as insignificant as a fight you got in with your friend over a text and it's bothering you. And I think that those sort of things you hold in over time can really, you know, have a burden on you. And So for my advice is, again, you know, if you're interested in learning more about what therapy is, we do have these discussions where basically people are going through their own problems on camera with a therapist. And it it does give you sort of like a bird's eye view and can help you understand sort of the thought process and the questions that therapists ask you to get you thinking differently. It's, It's funny. This is actually how I view the podcast. And so every time I leave this situation... I think the entrepreneurs and all of us feel so much better because we're all fighting some battle, whether it's raising money, whether it's finding employees, whether it's getting more user growth, user traction. And so just having the conversation with someone like you, it makes me feel better because I'm in this together, right? It's like, no, we're not alone. Whereas I think especially during COVID, you can easily feel like you're on an island and you're in your head. It's just you in your head. And it's you in your head on a walk with a mask on. <laughs> it's just it like, doesn't there's have no- to be like so dramatic, like, oh, we're not alone. Like we're both victims. It can literally be like fundraising sucked. I did not enjoy it at all. And like just someone else hearing that could be like, oh, thank God. Like I thought everyone liked it. Like I thought everyone was just going being like, oh, it was so easy. I did two meetings. And sometimes that's like what's really helpful is to just be able to say that and have your therapist listen. And that's so powerful and that's what i'm trying to help people understand that it's like just not always about the big things it can just be about like venting can you guys give us a window into the business model and how it works for both yourselves and and for the therapist on the platform as sage mentioned it's kind of a business in a box so it's a monthly subscription that the therapists pay and it extends beyond the matching lead gen it's you know payment processing hipaa compliant video tools calendar tools all of you know everything you need to sort of get your business off the ground and right now it's completely free as consumers to use it so the only thing you're paying for is the actual therapy itself and also our discussions are completely free too and how much is a, let's say like an hour session? I don't know if it depends depending on the therapist on the platform, but maybe you can give us a range of what that costs. That's another thing is that when you're not tied to physical location, you can let the therapist set rates. And it's really interesting. Like a lot of them have different agendas, different rates. Um, and I think ranges from anywhere from $50 to 200 on our platform. 
Okay. And all the therapists are asked to set a high demand, high volume and low volume time. So typically a therapist has times in their schedule that are harder to fill and they're willing to take a lower rate at that price point. So there is flexibility with all the therapists on the platform as well. There's like a demand-based pricing to it. That's smart mm -hmm. based on their calendar. Yeah. And we really want to empower the therapist to run their own business. Like Kendall said, so we, you know, when therapists ask me, when I talk to them about it, they're like, Oh, how much do I have to charge? Or is there, you know, we encourage them to set a rate that feels comfortable for them. So, you know, don't set your low rate lower than you would feel comfortable because we're not, you know, it's not going to benefit anyone if you're underselling yourself or undercutting yourself at the end of the day. When you guys think about your business, I mean, one of the, obviously the terms is like chicken and the egg, right? For you guys, it's a double-sided market. So who, what's, what's, what, what has been the most challenging to get? Inherently, I think users are always the difficult ones, right? Because they are the ones that have to pay, whereas a therapist can be paid. Has that been true? Or have you guys seen maybe it go the other way? We haven't really had trouble on either side yet, which I guess is a good sign. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. That's a great answer for all the people who want to invest listening. Yeah, we really <laughs> haven't. Um, there's been a lot of willingness to try it from the consumers and excitement. And then on the therapist side, they're also very curious about the way we've approached the problem for therapists to solve, which has been great feedback. I think that's always a problem that marketplace startups have is sort of like the give and take. And I think that's something that we're really focused on for us this year, since we are pre-seed and it's more about product market fit is really understanding what types of therapists we need versus just getting, let's get 10,000 therapists. Like how many Hispanic therapists do we need? How many female therapists? What type of therapy do they, do we need to be providing? Do we need more that specialize in substance abuse? So that's sort of been something that I think we're still learning and it just depends on like who your core customer is, which we're also still learning and sort of trying to understand the needs of that. So I think to answer both sides, you know, have been going pretty well, but I think something we're, we're monitoring closely is when we do need to ramp up a lot, you know, what, who are we ramping up with for the therapists? And did you guys think about maybe applying to any accelerator programs at the beginning, whether it was like YC or Techstars or anything? We're actually in an accelerator. We're in two accelerators. <laughs> um, we're in one called Founders Factory, which is based in New York, and it's really great. Um, they are invested through Johnson & Johnson, which has been a great partner of ours and been amazing. I feel like they're a celebrity now. Every time I'm like, when's the vaccine coming? And they're like, we can't tell you that, Kendall. <laughs> That's funny. But, and then we're in an incubator with Imran Khan, who was a former chief strategy officer at Snapchat. That is a little bit more under the radar for, for Snap alum. Sure, that's amazing. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, I assume that's helped tremendously so far. How's that been going? I mean, I, I don't know if it's an in-person thing or you just do like weekly meetings or bi-weekly meetings. It's really helpful. I was always like, you know, hesitant or nervous about applying for the, the accelerators and stuff, but it's been very helpful. I think they both are such different styles of incubator, but, and even they'll joke with me every, every time I fight it, they always bring up good points and sort of keep us on track. And it's just been really interesting to hear different perspectives in a safe space and not feel like there's any agenda there where they're just, you know, just trying to help. One thing I just thought of, well, I thought of this like 20 minutes ago, but it just resurfaces. Like, are there any like therapist influencers in the space that you guys could partner with? Yeah, there are. Okay. There actually are. There's like this crazy trend where <laughs> there's like um, the rise of the um, Instagram therapist. They range from anywhere from like 30,000 followers to a million followers. And I think there's just a real, like a crave for mental health content. I mean, Sage, when you feel like, I feel like there's like almost this pressure as a therapist, like you have to have your own Instagram now. Yeah. I mean, a lot of therapists make an Instagram for marketing essentially, and to be able to connect with like their audience or, or, you know, with the client population in a way that's, it's still personal, but in, it's also, you know, public and, and anyone can access it. So I think it's also a way for therapists to get their name out there and then also to be able to share 
quick insights and, and resources. It's something that Kendall and I look at a lot. You know, I'm always sending her things that I find from therapists that I like. You know, I think it, it's, there's definitely a therapist influencer out there. <laughs> and these are all like licensed individuals. In some cases, maybe they're just like motivational speakers. I don't know. Yeah, no, they're they're all licensed therapists. We've been working with several of them and it's been, it's like the wild west of the Instagram influencers, I feel like. I was just thinking of like Leslie Jordan, who uh, became super famous during this time, but is like an old, older comedian and has been a therapist for a lot of people just through comedy, which is kind of funny. We work with one that like is amazing, um, Alyssa Mancow, and she was telling, I mean, like she gets like, you know, hit up for sponsorships of like the most random things. And she's like trying to decide like authentically for her brand as a therapist, like she can't be like promoting like beef, you know, like, <laughs> can't be like randomly like, and here's this beef patty that I love. And she's like talking about trauma, like racial trauma. So it's, yeah. I feel like that's why it's sort of the wild west, not for me personally, but I feel like I'm sure there are brands out there that are like, how can we crack these influencers that have 100,000 followers in a way that's like authentic? There's we, something like 100% Wagyu beef to get me through the day. <laughs> we literally just had this conversation because we're like thinking about bringing on sponsors and it's like, it has to be so relevant, you know? Otherwise it's like an entrepreneur doesn't care about something like, I don't, I don't even know, like just something so not inside the bubble of entrepreneurship that it makes our job like, do we really want to do that? And there, obviously there's an attractiveness because you're like, well, you know, you're talking about real revenue. But on the other side, it's like you have to stay true to your audience. Podcast is kind of the wild west with advertising too. I mean, coming from the paid advertising space at YouTube and Snapchat. Yeah, I think it all goes, the way I think about it is like, it all goes down to your why, right? It's, it all goes down to like, why have you created what you're creating? And just staying true to that. and. I think people that try to come into your space, whatever it is, if they come in with honest intentions, then their why matches. And when it doesn't match, it's pretty obvious. And so then we just have to stay on course with what we're trying to achieve. I don't know, entrepreneurs could use some beef. I'm sure you could get it. <laughs> <laughs> One last question before we go. It is my understanding that this is not the first company or the first business venture that you both have undergone together, stemming back from a lemonade stand. And space. I was like, what? Yes, we started, we were next door neighbors. We started a lemonade stand. There's very little traffic that comes through on our street. <laughs> and so you had the market cornered on the lemonade stand in that area. His dad bought all of the lemonade. The lemons too, probably. The lemons, yes. Yeah, well. <laughs> but it was successful. We had 100% sales. <laughs> so, that's success. That's all you can ask for. Well, listen, tell everyone where they can find you, whether they're looking for therapy, looking for a digital discussion, or even are a therapist looking to go into a digital format. Tell everyone where they can find you. You can find us at tryframe.com or on Instagram at try.frame. Awesome. Well, look, thank you guys both for your time. I love what you guys are doing. I'm rooting for you. I think people, everyone needs therapy. Everyone needs someone to talk to. And so I think you're poised for success. At least I hope so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank yeah, you very you much bet. for your time.